coming in at number 10, we have Steve Rogers, AKA Captain America. One of America's very first superheroes in the Marvel Universe during the Second World War, Steve Roger is notorious for dodging certain death after surviving his plane crashing into the frozen Atlantic Ocean through suspended animation. Even since becoming a modern hero, however, Cap still can't seem to stay dead, with the occasion where he seemed to be assassinated by crossbones actually resulting in his consciousness traveling through time. An inconvenient misadventure, but certainly less permanent than death. And given the fact that the Super Soldier Serum also seems to at least drastically slow Steve's aging, and Captain America just might be more immortal than you'd think. Coming in at number nine, we have Alec Holland, AKA the Swamp Thing. The being that now calls itself Alec Holland is in reality the Avatar of the Green, an immortal being dedicated to protecting all nature and plant life on planet Earth that absorbed the memories and consciousness of a man named Alec Holland after a tragic chemical explosion in the swamps of Louisiana. As long as there exists some form of plant life on Earth, the Swamp Thing can regrow his body from this plant and transfer his consciousness, essentially ensuring that there'll always be an avatar of the green protecting Earth and that the memory of Alec Holland will truly never ever die. Coming in at number eight, we have Jean Grey, AKA the Dark Phoenix. An X-Men storyline and character turn so iconic that they've tried turning it into a movie on two separate occasions, Jean Grey has long been one of the ideal hosts of the Phoenix Force, a fiery power that's one of the oldest in the Marvel Universe. This incredible force is capable of healing any injury that Jean receives, and is even capable of resurrecting her entirely if she's killed by unnatural means. Combined with her natural mutant abilities, already making her one of the most powerful telepaths in the entire Marvel Universe, potentially rivaling even those of Professor X, and Jean Grey will be one of the most important mutants for many, many ages to come. Coming in at number seven, we have Ben Grimm, AKA The Thing. As the physically strongest member of the Fantastic Four with an intimidating appearance to boot, the Thing is respected throughout the Marvel world for always having his family's back, and even being capable of standing up to someone as powerful as the Hulk when the need arises. Ben's change into a being made out of a mysterious rock-like substance also had some unexpected side effects, however, such as the fact that while in Thing form, he never ages. This is offset slightly by the fact that Ben is capable of appearing human for one day a year due to the tinkering of the rest of the Fantastic Four, but aging only one day a year extends your lifespan dramatically, and combine that with all of the near-death situations or universal collapses that the Fantastic Four have avoided together, and Ben Grimm definitely earns the title of being practically immortal. Coming in at number six, we have the Incredible Hulk, AKA Bruce Banner. Considering the Hulk's most popular and critically acclaimed series of the last decade was literally called the Immortal Hulk, obviously the big green guy earns a spot on this list. Built around the twist that the Incredible Hulk has always been immortal and that Bruce Banner first died during the original Gamma Bomb explosion and has been constantly resurrecting ever since, this series took the Hulk into a wild new body horror direction. With all gamma-powered beings apparently being connected to the one below all in a way that allows them to circumvent even the natural process of death, the Hulk is apparently a problem that can never be permanently solved. Coming in at number five, we have Kevin Connor, AKA Starbrand. Taking his name from the literal star brand he possesses, Kevin is one of the most powerful heroes to ever be called an Avenger gaining his powers during an Earth-wide cosmic flash known as the White Event. Gaining the ability to control and manipulate energy at a scale only limited by his imagination, Starbrand is incredibly physically powerful and capable of healing any wound on both himself or any of his allies. Starbrand is so powerful that he's one of the few beings to ever kill a Beyonder, destroying one of the multiversal beings when the Marvel Universe was collapsing in a massive explosion, yet somehow reappearing unharmed once the Marvel Universe was restored. And if you can heal from an explosion at the end of all existence, I think you might be able to survive pretty much anything. 
Coming in at number four, we have Thor Odinson, the God of Thunder. While several Marvel and DC superheroes have godlike powers, Thor is one of the very few that counts as a literal god. Having protected both Midgard and Asgard for thousands upon thousands of years, Thor has already had eons worth of adventures by the time we were introduced to the character in the comics. And according to all the storylines that feature an older All-Father Thor, he'll continue to outlive the rest of the Avengers by thousands and thousands of years more. With even the Norse apocalypse of Ragnarok focusing on the concept of renewal and rebirth, Thor is a heroic god that will likely never truly see a permanent end. Coming in at number three, we have the notoriously durable Wolverine. When Wolverine was first introduced in the comics, his healing ability was just a quirk that made him a more intimidating warrior. Any cuts or bruises would just quickly become a non-issue to him. But as time went on and Wolverine became a more popular character, his healing abilities as a mutant became one of his most defining features, even more so than his iconic claws. Wolverine's healing abilities, combined with his indestructible adamantium skeleton, have been shown to be so great over the years that he's even been able to withstand the full force of a nuclear bomb, and getting his entire body ripped in half by the Ultimate Hulk. Even in the few instances where someone has been able to officially kill Wolverine, he somehow found his way back to the land of the living through time travel or magical means, ensuring that Wolverine will live on to fight another day. Coming in at number two, we have the one and only Superman. Perhaps the most iconic superhero of all time, Superman is also where giant death of a hero events hit their peak, with the huge 90s cultural moment of the death of Superman. After a grueling multi-issue battle through the streets of Metropolis that saw Superman giving up his life to defeat the unstoppable killer Doomsday, it appeared that the Man of Steel was dead for good. However, after a long storyline that saw multiple imposter Superman show up, Superman was shown to have not truly died, but merely been placed in Kryptonian stasis until he was able to be healed enough to resume being a superhero. Even after the beating of a lifetime from a complete monster, Superman remained unstoppable and has remained unkillable to this day. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have the Venom symbiote. In a potential alternate future seen in the one-off story called Venom, The End, it was revealed that the most famous symbiote in the Marvel Universe has a longer shelf life than you'd expect. Keeping his host Eddie Brock alive for hundreds of years past a normal human lifespan, this story explores the symbiote finally letting go of its oldest friend and becoming the sole organic being left in a universe slowly dying to an artificial intelligence plague known as the God Mind. The symbiote wound up being the very last living thing before the universe was reset, showing that the most immortal creature in the Marvel Universe might just be a pile of black goo. No offense, Venom. In its end, Moon Knight, Mark Spector is better known as the vigilante Moon Knight. Once a mercenary, Mark Spector was left for dead in the desert, where he was revived by the moon god Khonshu. Appointed Khonshu's first and high priest, Moon Knight enacts justice to protect those who travel at night. Spectre also suffers from disassociative identity disorder, which has paved the way for his use of other identities, including millionaire Stephen Grant, a cat, and cab driver Jake Lockley. Since the early days, Mark has mostly worked alone, but he's also been a member of a few superhero teams, including the Avengers and Heroes for Hire. Recently, Mark discovered that he had a daughter named Deatrice with his longtime lover Marlene Arlone. But when Khonshu sensed Mephisto's plans for world domination, Mark left her to fight by his god's side and prevent that from coming true. When Khonshu succumbed to madness, however, Mark had to turn against him and help the Avengers defeat him. However, whenever Moon Knight would end up dying, Khonshu would just bring him back to life. So yeah, in essence, he's immortal. In at 9, Elongated Man. As his name suggests, the Elongated Man can stretch his limbs and body to superhuman lengths and sizes. There seems to be no limit to how far or wide he can stretch, but it's more difficult to control this ability the further he's actually stretched out. However, this also allows him to absorb bullets and then even just shoot them back by tightening his skin. He can also contort his body into various positions and sizes impossible for ordinary humans, such as being entirely flat so that he can slip on a door or using his fingers to pick a conventional locks. He can also use it for a disguise by changing the shape of his face, although this is painful and difficult for him. But 
Being able to stretch and move your body at will could also potentially allow you to stretch your life for longer than it should be. I mean, like, if his heart is giving out, theoretically, Ralph can can just like force his heart to keep pumping by literally doing it himself, right? He can like sh shrink his heart and make it pump, right? So like it is partially possible, or at least there is a slight chance that he could be immortal, which is after all what this list is all about. It's might be immortal, right? In at eight, Ghost Rider. Jonathan Johnny Blaze, aka Ghost Rider, is an American motorcycle stunt performer and entertainer turned spirit of vengeance. He was the son of famed stuntman Barton Blaze, who tragically died during a stunt. He became bound to Zarathos and the spirit of vengeance after making a deal with the demon Mephisto to spare the life of his surrogate father, Crash Simpson. Now, with the power to control Hellfire and to inflict pain on those deemed evil with his penance stare, Blaze seeks vengeance riding his Hell Cycle as the Ghost Rider. But like, being the spirit of vengeance, being in debt to Mephisto kind of makes you pretty immortal in my book. Like, in human form, Johnny has no possession of any superhuman powers or supernatural capabilities, but as Ghost Rider, he's the supernatural combination between experienced motorcyclist and Zarathos. As the Ghost Rider, Johnny Blaze possesses a variety of supernatural powers at his disposal. However, any weapon crafted from heaven or like blessed can mutilate the Ghost Rider, which is the only way to decapitate and kill a spirit of vengeance. So without that, he's immortal. In its 7th Supergirl. Last part, Josh talked about how Superman was basically unkillable ever since the death of Superman comic event, since he hadn't really been killed by Doomsday and instead was placed in Kryptonian stasis until he was able to be healed enough to return to being a superhero. However, the same thing can be said about Supergirl, okay? Kara Zor-El, Kal-El's older cousin who got sucked through a wormhole, making her quite a bit younger than her cousin when she got to Earth. Despite this, okay, Kal and Kara have the same Kryptonian ancestry, making them equal. So, if Superman is basically unkillable at this point, so is Supergirl. It's just basic math. Or like, weird comic book genetics math. Since he equals her, they would both be deemed unkillable or immortal. And I think that that's fairly cut and dry. Like, obviously they can be killed, but so can basically everyone on this list, okay? So let's just cut the semantics and just, like, ignore the nuance. <laughs> I just I just said that to a YouTube comments section. I wonder how effective that's gonna be. And it's 6, Spider-Man. First officially referenced in 2005's official handbook of the Marvel Universe, Alternate Universes 2005 number 1, the sliding time scales is an attempt to quantify the passage of time in Earth-616 so that the characters don't age noticeably. Earth-616 featuring a sliding time scale means that rather than being fixed to any date in history, the modern era, which starts with the events of Fantastic Four number 1 and continues to the present, continuously slides forward in time. This period is roughly 13 years, which means that at any time in the present, the space flight that gave birth to the Fantastic Four always happened around 13, 14 years ago. Meaning that basically everyone in the Marvel Universe can't die of old age. Meaning that while stories like Spider-Man Reign among others take place in a time where Spider-Man is old, his main 616 version is pretty damn immortal. Especially because he's Marvel's most popular superhero, which means that this man has like a death grip on Marvel so hard that they cannot physically let him go. Halfway through into number 5, Wonder Woman. The Dark Knight's death metal story wrapped wrapped up early 2021 with issue number 7. And in that issue, and the issue before, we see Wonder Woman at her most powerful, in a godlike form that's even more powerful than a god. As the comic book puts it, quote, She has been a god before, but at this moment, she's more. At this point, she has ascended past godhood and can see all of time and all realities. She sees every Earth's timeline, and she faces off against the Batman who laughs in his most powerful form. This fight is so intense that they literally hit each other through time itself. Diana here is also charged with anti-crisis energy, a connective force that links all history and all lives as one story. Then, she moves on to become one of the hands that creates the multiverse going forward, with no walls and greater possibilities. So she aids in creating the future state story, which we see in the next issues, and that was seemingly the centerpiece of DC 2021. So, uh, Wonder Woman becoming a god and remaking the universe? Sounds pretty immortal if you ask me. And at four, Mr. Fantastic. In addition to the whole sliding timescale thing, which actually starts with him, making him immortal as well, Reed Richards' abilities also make him quite powerful. Mr. Fantastic possesses the ability to convert the mass of his entire body into a highly malleable state at will, which is what allows him to stretch. However, this also gives him the ability to absorb bullets and make himself more dense. Basically, all the reasons why elongated man would be immortal like I explained earlier. But the reason Reed has a leg up on Ralph is because of his son. Franklin Richards is one of, if not the most powerful being in the entire Marvel Universe, even as an infant boy. This guy came to the present from the future and made Galactus his herald. Yeah, this dude made Galactus his b****. 
And Mr. Fantastic's kid being somehow the most overpowered thing in the universe, there's no way that he would let his father die. If he wanted to, he could just like blink and his father would be resurrected. That's some Omega level shit. Like he is like a Zeta level mutant, okay? It's insane. There's no way that this guy is dying. There's no way his dad is dying. I'll save Franklin Richards though for another list because I'm gonna need more numbers if there is one. Getting close to the end in number three, Batman. Batman is possibly immortal for the same reason that Spider-Man is, in a way. Well, at least like the whole popularity thing. Probably even more so because there is no way that they would kill off Batman in the main continuity. They may have other timelines or Earths where Batman dies, but never in the main continuity will they pull a move this big, okay? His plot armor is what makes him immortal. It doesn't matter if Batman has been a thing for over 80 years, he will always be young and immortal, at least in our world. And even if Bruce does die, someone takes over the Batman mantle, and and people commonly see the one who takes over as the proper Batman since the public doesn't know that Bruce being dead means that Batman is dead, but you know, th th whatever. Honestly though, Batman would end up killing death if the story needed it, and honestly there would be no question in people's minds. They'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. In the comments of times Batman embarrassed his villains, everyone seems to agree with me that Batman's greatest power isn't his money or his courage, but instead the plot armor given to him because he's DC's biggest money maker. But ultimately, in a number two, Sentry. Sentry is an absolute absolute powerhouse, so it's no surprise that he's basically immortal, okay? Even, like, any threat this dude will take on. Sentry has even fought and beaten Ares, which is already impressive, but how he did it is even better. Sentry used to be a part of Norman Osborn's Avengers, who went to Asgard in an attempt to lay siege and claim it, because, you know, it's Norman Osborn's Avengers. However, the Marvel version of the Greek God of War didn't like that idea, so after he learned of Osborn's intentions, he came down to kill the Green Goblin. But Ares did not anticipate the absolute powerhouse that is Sentry. Sentry's monster arms. He picked him up and tore him in half. Okay? Like how the absolute living hell did this man tear a Greek god in half? He absolutely obliterated the god of war without breaking a sweat. And if that doesn't show you the sheer power of Sentry and how overpowered Marvel thinks that Superman is, then nothing will actually show you at this point. You're a lost cause. But yeah, I feel like that makes him immortal. And finally, and at number one, The Flash. Technically speaking, the comic version of Barry Allen survived Crisis on Infinite Earths, despite everyone believing him to be dead, since he returned to the Speed Force after turning into the lightning bolt that gave him his powers to begin with. That's also an interesting story. But after transforming into pure lightning, traveling through time and space, and striking himself, Barry was sent back into the Speed Force, and later escapes and comes back into our world in the Flash Rebirth storyline. So technically, he survived the comic version of Crisis because he didn't die, okay? He just, he just transcended dimensions, which is a damn testament to how the Flash will never really die, okay? If he can have a very public and very impactful sacrifice to save literally all of reality and then just be brought back because he just went into the Speed Force like some sort of speedster Valhalla, it just makes me think that if any speedster dies, they'll just go into the Speed Force and then be able to be brought back. And in reality, every character is immortal if the writers want to bring them back for whatever reason. They will always find a way. In a 10, Squirrel Girl. There are two types of people in this world, those who have heard of Squirrel Girl and those who don't know what true happiness really is. Suffering a modification in her genes for unknown reasons, Doreen Green gained squirrel-like abilities, most obviously in the form of a prehensile tail, but she was somehow not a mutant. She realized she could communicate with squirrels when she overheard one in her window. She saved it from being chased by a dog and they ultimately became friends. That squirrel encouraged her to use her powers to help people, but he also called himself Monkey Joe, so I don't know if he was a comedian or just stupid. Her first appearance was in Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2 number 8 in 1991 alongside Iron Man, but only really got traction in the 21st century when fans went nuts for her. Get it? Nuts for her? Because she's a squirrel girl. Well, anyway, due to her popularity and wholesome nature, there isn't really going to be an opportunity for her to get killed off, especially when she's gone up against Galactus, Thanos, and Doctor Doom without a scratch. Unless we believe Rick and Morty, which says that if you overhear squirrels, you're going to have to leave the whole dimension. So I think that's really the scary part. She's probably in cahoots with the squirrels, toppling nations. 
you know. And at 9, head pull. On Earth 2149, the reality was similar to that of the 616 universe we are familiar with, with only a few differences. One of them being Steve Rogers was Colonel America, and one of them being a literal zombie plague that turned all superheroes into zombies. Fairly topical if you ask me. Well, the Deadpool of this universe has another thing coming, since after a fight with the Silver Surfer, he was brought to Earth 616, where he took out Jennifer Kale's magic. He was thought to have been killed when he got lured into the blades of a nearby skiff, completely obliterating him. But since he was the only one with the virus on this earth, he was contained by armor. Deadpool was now only a head, but still managed to escape Armor HQ with the help of Simon Garth. Headpool is basically just zombie Deadpool's head, and the fact that this exists is so Deadpool it hurts. And the fact that he didn't die when reduced to only a head is something that would literally kill almost anyone else is proof enough that Headpool cannot be killed. The merc with half a mouth is still hopping around and gonna bust the cap in your ass because it's the only thing he can reach with the gun. Pretty funny, but still scary since, you know, it's a thing. It's a zombie head. Jeez. And it ain't Lobo. Let's face it, Lobo is one pretty scary looking dude. While first he was introduced as a villain in the 80s, he was revived as an anti-hero in the early 90s after his creators forgot about him. How can you forget about him? Lobo is one crazy bounty hunter, with muscles that are more ripped than my homework every time I told my teachers that my dog had eaten it. I didn't have a dog. And with the attitude and outfit to match. I think the scariest part about him though is just the hair. He even ended up joining the new Justice League at one point, becoming one of its founding members. Lobo probably has one of the coolest power sets. While it may not be super speed or the power of the gods, he can shake off blows from even Superman, taking planet destroying attacks without a scratch. But he is also banned from entering both heaven and hell, making him functionally immortal. If you aren't allowed to enter the afterlife, I'm pretty sure you won't be able to even get the chance to. And honestly, I'm already banned from entering one of them, so all I need is the other one to hate me and I'm golden. I'll be in the same boat as Lobo. Just wish I had those muscles though. And at 7, the Eternal Warrior. Being named such because he existed prior to recorded history, the Eternal Warrior is one of three brothers who are also as ancient as my 12th grade contact teacher. Boom! I haven't let it go. He has defended Earth for thousands of years and has acquired a millennia of military knowledge and more than just that, he has seen history unfold. Other than being immortal, he possesses increased strength, agility, incredible durability, and an incredibly impressive healing factor that allowed him to survive nuclear fallout. Within the Valiant universe that he was written into, there is no known way of killing him. He is sworn to protect the Geomancers to ensure their survival. These people have a special bond with the Earth and there must always be one alive to protect protect it and speak for it. In more ways than one, the Eternal Warrior is the protector of Earth more than Hal Jordan or any other hero. As long as the planet exists, the Eternal Warrior will as well, which is pretty dope. When only the inevitable heat death of the universe can kill you? <laughs> I'd take that. And at 6, Ghost Rider. Johnny Blaze agrees to give his soul to the devil in order to save his father's life. Because of this, at night, when he is around evil, he becomes surrounded in literal hellfire and his head becomes a fiery skull. First appearing in Marvel Spotlight number 5, Ghost Rider rides a fiery motorcycle and can launch blasts of hellfire from his typically skeletal hands. There have been many incarnations of Ghost Rider over the years, notably Johnny Blaze, Noble Kane, Danny Ketch, and Robbie Reyes. The fact that there will never not be a Ghost Rider serves as more of a permanent way of not being able to die, but that's in spirit. The whole making a deal with the devil and becoming a literal hellfire demon when around evil thing helps too and is probably more along the lines of what was expected for this list. Especially because who doesn't want to ride a motorcycle that cool? I remember in high school I wanted to get my motorcycle license instead of my driver's license since I could drive a motorcycle by myself faster than a car but my mom wouldn't let me. Well look at me now mom on my own and unable to afford the test or even a damn motorcycle. Halfway through at number 5, The Hulk. The Hulk is one bad man pajama, and the fact that he is made from radiation should remind you that there is no way of killing this guy. Bruce himself even said in the first Avengers movie he tried to kill himself as Bruce, but Hulk spit the bullet out. This is even further solidified by the future and perfect storyline. When Hulk is brought 100 years into the future and sees himself, still alive even after a nuclear war that had killed almost all of Earth's superhumans. This war, by the way, had also taken the world to the brink of extinction, meaning Hulk, or Maestro as he was known then, was one of the only remaining souls in existence. 
but I guess technically that can be said about all of us even right now. This in combination with Maestro absorbing the radiation from the nukes giving him increased strength proves to be too much for Professor Hulk. Maestro is only able to be destroyed by the same bomb that created the Hulk in the first place, which is honestly understandable. Like when your parents say I brought you into this world I can take you out even though they legally can't, but that's aside the point. If you can only be destroyed by the thing that created you, you will never be able to be destroyed again unless time travel is possible in which case this was so. Yeah. In at 4, the Spectre. The Spectre is an entity who needs to bind itself to the soul of a human being. However, the human who becomes the Spectre must already be dead, which may defeat the purposes of this list if you think about it, but I'm talking about the Spectre itself, not the person it inhabits, so... Apples and oranges. The Spectre is omnipotent and immortal, having powers over reality, interdimensional travel, technically resurrection, and increasing to infinite size and a lot more that honestly doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But in honesty, it's, it's comics. Not making sense makes it make sense. Just like that sentence. The Spectre has had many hosts over the years, Jim Corrigan, Crispus Allen, Hal Jordan, and Oliver Queen to name a few. The latter being in the CW's Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover. Where while Oliver Queen might have died, the Spectre itself is impossible to destroy, making him probably the most powerful being in the DC Universe. I kinda wanna be the Spectre, that green cloak's kinda bomb. Not gonna lie. And at 3, Franklin Richards. Hey, it's Franklin. Franklin Richards is one powerful kiddo, like the son of a Karen who stepped on a Lego with a full shoe on, but who's crying because he broke the Lego powerful. The mutant son of Sue Storm and Reed Richards is one of the most powerful beings in Marvel canon. This Omega level mutant possesses the ability to completely alter reality, and that in a way makes him immortal. Having complete control over the fundamental forces of the universe is a pretty big power to have when you're a toddler who just wants chicken nugs and choco milk. His powers even allowing him to perceive future events. Sure, Sure, you could just push him out a window after you climbed up a tower, but hell, he'll just come back in a wheelchair and become king later on. What I'm saying with that analogy that is as good as the ending is that he would see it coming, and could just alter life so that it would never happen. Plus, he can travel through time. This kid can make a pocket universe under his bed sheets while he should be sleeping. The laws of reality don't apply to this kid, so you will never be able to kill him. He's just too damn powerful. He is literally God. And at 2, everyone on Earth 10011. Earth 10011 is also known as the Cancerverse, an Earth whose history is identical to that of the main Earth 616, but with the Avatar of Death being destroyed when Marvel was on his deathbed, using a ritual known as Necropsy. They eliminated the Avatar of Death, making it impossible for anyone to ever die on this Earth. However, this doesn't mean that you stay in your prime forever. No, the Avatar of Aging, if that's even a thing, is still kicking, and you're gonna have more wrinkles than a Kardashian before she goes to see Dr. Fix Me Up. Death is literally dead. There is no way you can die on this earth. That is all I can say about this. And that just proves my point. I wanted this to be number one, but there is something more current that I feel will make more sense in this context. But like after this whole thing has died out, no pun intended, I, I guess it won't really make more sense. Whatever. Finally, in at number one, Liesl Pawn. Liesl Pawn is one of the more obscure members of the Green Lantern Corps. I'd say, honestly, one of the most obscure. And while Liesl may not be able to be killed, the reasoning requires some explanation. Liesl Pawn is a smallpox virus, being microscopic yet sentient and capable enough to wield the Green Lantern ring. It goes on missions that other Green Lanterns can't undertake, be it physically or biologically. To be honest, Liesl has played an integral role in various Lantern events, like in the Sinestro Corps War where he helped to save Guy Gardner's life by defeating Sinestro's virus. Liesl cannot be killed because he's a virus. And technically a virus is not a living organism. Viruses are defined as organisms on the edge of life, since they defy all standard definitions of being alive. So while they're almost alive, they're not, and therefore cannot be killed in the same way. It can be destroyed, but it can't be killed, because technically it was never really alive. And I figured a virus was pretty topical for this list, so uh... There you go. It might be cheating, but I don't care. You're welcome. Starting us off in at number 10, Hope Summers. Hope is the adoptive daughter of Cable, a character who first debuted in 2007 in X-Men issue 205. She was the first mutant born after the events of House of M and Decimation. Now because of this, she had a big old target on her little baby back, because she was a baby then, with Cable saving her, claiming that she was a messiah destined to save both mutant and humankind. Now Hope is capable of something called superpower manipulation. This means she can mimic other powers, activate 
activate the powers of others and enhance powers. Plus, she's an Omega-level mutant to boot. She got a major power upgrade during the Avengers vs. X-Men story arc when the character was bonded with the Phoenix Force, which gave her immortality. Up next, number 9, Mistress Love. Let's move on to a Marvel character cut from a very different cloth, a god. We're talking about Mistress Love, who debuted back in 1982's Defenders issue 107. The character is the physical embodiment of love, much like how Mistress Death is the physical embodiment of death. While we've never seen the full extent of her powers, this abstract entity is one of the universe's most powerful, and she can control emotions related to love with any being, even on a universal scale. Her powers are said to be stronger than Galactus or Odin, but not as strong as Eternity or Infinity. Also, fun fact, her gender and appearance are mutable, meaning she can also be depicted as a man. She often reflects the desires of those who see her. Up next, number eight, Moira McTaggart. Moira is not just a hot scientist, people. This was big news in the recent House of X, where it was revealed that she wasn't just a human ally and a mutant advocate. Oh no, girl is a mutant too, people. And she's impressive as f Moira's mutant powers allow for her to reincarnate, in a sense. She's a mutant with limited reality warping reincarnation powers. She has perfect memory and is able to hide her true nature to mutants and mutant detection devices. So far, she's lived 10 lives, having started her life again after she died, possessing full memories of her previous lives. When she returns to being in utero, she's fully sentient. So yeah, that is pretty darn impressive. Moving on to number seven, DC's Valkyries. Moving on from Marvel over to DC for this number, let's talk about a group of bad women, the Valkyries. While notably different than the Valkyries of Marvel fame, DC's Valkyries are still rooted in Nordic legend, being armored maidens who ride winged horses from a place called Asgard. They would first appear in a DC comic all the way back in 1946 in Comic Cavalade issue 17 and have appeared since with little consistency. In the Golden Age, they appeared as Wonder Woman villains, but now on Prime Earth, they are part of the same race as the Amazons. Hmm. Regardless, they have always remained immortal beings, ones with superhuman strength and quite the talent for combat. Up next, number six, Serk from Earth 2. Another DC character at this number. Serk, specifically the Serk of Earth 2, is immortal. This version, who debuted during the Golden Age in 1949's Wonder Woman issue 37, was initially a villain for Diana prior to being defeated by her. After her defeat, she would be taken to a place called Transformation Island, located on Paradise Island, where she was taught the ways of love and discipline by the Amazonians. Cirque's immortality is rooted in her magic powers. She also has the ability to command Sorkan jewelry trees using chlorokinesis and is capable of metamorphosis with the ability to turn humans into animals. She also has a killer jawline. That's a power too, right? In at number five, Threnody. Threnody is Melody Jacobs, a Marvel mutant who first graced their panels in 1993 in Strife's Strike File issue one. She's a necroplasmic energy vampire, empowered by necroplasm. She's capable of sensing certain necroplasmic energies that surround an individual when they are dying or near death. To her, she's enraptured by the scent of death and the taste of the energy. Eerie, isn't it? She can also manipulate said energy to absorb the remaining life energies that a dying individual is releasing, and then can convert them into explosive plasma or temporarily reanimate someone into a zombie. In other words, don't f*** with her. She can create hordes of zombies if the energy is in supply. Now, because of these powers, she is also immortal, able to absorb the necroplasmic energy of her own death in order to regenerate or return to life. Up next, number four, All Mother Storm. This version of X-Men member Storm hails from Earth 20329, also known as Marvel's steampunk god world. Yes, that is a thing. This is a universe riddled by mutant gods, who eventually an evil Charles Xavier took mental control of. In this universe, Storm is an immortal god known as the Skybreaker and is married to Thor. When she was taken over by Xavier mentally, he caused her to create a massive drought. Luckily, she wasn't under his control for too long and would offer the other X-Men the ability to become immortal, turning Emmeline Frost Summers into an immortal god with a diamond body. I wonder who her parents are. All Mother Storm has the same powers as her 616 counterpart, but with a divine twist, seeing that she is immortal and has the ability to bestow god powers and immortality onto others. And as she puts it, she's free forever from the pain, doubt, and agony of mortal life. Moving on to number three, Donna Troy. Donna Troy, previously known as Wonder Girl, is an Amazonian who, after some fun retconning, was created by an evil sorceress to destroy Wonder Woman. 
Diana would find out about this, save the day, and then shield Donna from the truth of her origin by giving her false memories of being a normal girl who was rescued and raised as an Amazonian. Ah yes, gotta love a retcon. Donna would become a founding member of the Teen Titans and has long remained a part of DC's canon despite enduring her fair share of retcons, as we mentioned multiple times in this number. She was gifted immortality thanks to her Amazonian physiology. Amazonians, fun fact, can live forever, but can be killed in combat or by accident. And if you're part of the Amazonians of Bana Migdal, well, they lost their immortality when they broke apart from the original Amazonian group, so. With Donna Troy being on our list, it's probably no surprise that our next number found her way into our top three, and at number two, Wonder Woman. In general, Wonder Woman is a character who has had a tough time getting killed thanks to how immensely strong and powerful she is. For the record, on Prime Earth, Diana Prince has been bestowed with divine empowerment gifted with various powers by the gods of Olympus. She's a demigoddess with longevity that allows her to live much longer than the regular human being. But she ain't immortal. That being said, she is a character who has had multiple iterations of her created in the past that exist on other Earths that are, in fact, immortal. This is the case on Earth 2, Earth 508, aka DC Super Friends, Gal Gadot in the DC Extended Universe, a slew of negative Earths for the Dark Multiverse, many of which she's murdered in despite being immortal, and even the Wonder Woman television series starring Linda Carter. Diana, in general, is also one of DC's iconic trifecta, meaning she's got a decent amount of plot armor that prevents her from being killed off at the whims of DC's publishers. And hey, that counts for something, right? And finally, in our number one spot, Jean Grey. I mean, there's a slew of jokes that could be made here. Girl has died again, and again, and again, and again. But there's also a lot of truth to it, thanks to her being an Omega-level mutant and one of the most powerful female superheroes out there. Jean, without the Phoenix Force, is incredibly powerful. But when acting as the Phoenix Force's avatar, that power multiplies significantly. She's capable of manipulating matter and energy on a subatomic scale using her telekinesis. She's capable of resurrection, which is largely to thank for a handful of her resurrections. This makes her immortal to an extent. When she does die, she won't stay dead. Case in point, let's count those deaths and resurrections. Or at least some of them. The first happened in Uncanny X-Men issue 101 in 1975 when she first encountered the Phoenix while trying to telepathically maneuver a space shuttle with her teammates on it safely back to Earth. She crashed and seemingly died, but turns out the Phoenix Force saved her, resurrecting her in that very same issue. Once it corrupted her a little later on, she took her own life in Uncanny X-Men issue 137 in 1980. After that, Madeline Pryor, her clone, showed up, Cyclops fell for Madeline, they had a kid, and then the real Jean came back in 1985 with the reveal that the Phoenix had actually made a copy of her and put her real body and self into an egg underwater, a Phoenix egg, in which she was reborn again and absolved of the planetary genocide that the Dark Phoenix version of her committed. Convenient. In the early 90s, Jean would be killed by a sentinel, but then resurrected two issues later. Then, during Grant Morrison's run on New X-Men, he killed her off when the Phoenix Force bonded with the real her. And in order to stop her, Magneto used an electromagnetic pulse to give her a stroke, with Wolverine then stabbing her in order to save her from an agonizing death. I mean, that sounds pretty agonizing to me. She would be resurrected again in 2005 in Phoenix Song, in which her soul went into a dimension known as the White Hot Room and ascended to another plane of existence. So technically she was dead, but not really? From there, whether she was dead or not, she would be MIA for over a decade, eventually coming back in 2018 in a story titled Phoenix Resurrection, The Return of Jean Grey. Grotesque was once a prince that lived in the underground realm of Subterranea. He is also so hard to kill. His first big fight that we got to see was against the X-Men. Grotesque was the last living member of his kingdom. An earthquake caused by Dr. Hunt destroyed the underground civilization, and of course, one survivor remained Grotesque. He rightfully guessed that the above world caused the earthquake and came up to avenge his people. He learned of the earthquake machine and decided to use that to destroy the above world. He confronts the X-Men and the X-Men defeat him because Professor X used his mental power to stop the machine. Frustrated, Grotesque slammed himself into the machine to get it to work again, but that actually caused it to explode. The X-Men thought that the explosion killed him and Professor X. They were wrong. Professor X wasn't actually there. It was actually Changeling that had been pretending to be Professor X under Professor X's command, and well, Grotesque just 
can't die, so. He went on to fight Miss Marvel. She also hit him with something that should have killed him. He survived and fought the Avengers, and then later Thor. In the Thor brawl, there was again a large energy blast that should have killed him, but didn't. Not really. His body was gone, but his spirit remained. His loyal captive followers, the Lava Men, took that spirit and put it in an impenetrable armor, and he went on to fight the X-Men again, this time in San Francisco. Nightcrawler found the cheat code to defeat spirit armor grotesque. He took off his helmet. His spirit was released from the suit and dissolved. With his track record though, I wouldn't be surprised if grotesque appeared alive in a few years. Pretty Boy is more than just a punk pretty face. He has some pretty cool cybernetic implants that can expand to be three times their length. If you don't think he is pretty cool, he can just use his mind control powers to fix that. He gets access to a person's brain using these fiber optic filaments in his eyes. Then he kind of reprograms you. Pretty Boy is known for his affiliation with Donald Pierce. He was a member of the mercenary group Pierce created called the Reavers. While on this team, he passed away for the first time. Big moment in every Marvel character's journey. But like most Marvel heroes and villains, his death did not stick and he was soon back in action. The second passing happened under the leadership of Deathstrike and he was put six feet under by Logan. But again, it didn't stick and the guy was back in action, brawling against the X-Men. Eventually, by the end of the battle with the X-Men, he was arrested. The character debuted in 1988's Uncanny X-Men 229. A bonus story in Marvel Tales Volume 2, issue 262, featured the X-Men sparring against a pretty interesting group. They were known as the Desert Dwellers. Their leader was Sunstroke. He claimed he was created when a man's sense of strategy was melded with the power of the Daystar. I'm assuming the Daystar is the sun. Combining with the sun in this case gave Sunstroke the ability to create and absorb light and heat. The creation of the heat also allows the guy to fly. Sunstroke, like the X-Men, fights with a team, the Desert Dwellers. We'll actually get more into one member in a later video, but for now, there are three other things on the team. I say things, not people, because they were a cactus, stone, and lizard made into humanoid villain versions of themselves. Squad goals. The Desert Dwellers fought the X-Men when the X-Men were traveling through the desert. The Desert Dwellers attack the X-Men, but they don't actually care that they attack the X-Men flying plane. They just have been taking down flights for supplies. It's in this fight we learn that Sunstroke needs the sun to activate his powers, so storm creating clouds made him almost fall from the sky. Honestly, the Desert Dwellers are doing a pretty good job. Wolverine gets chucked into a mountain at one point, but the day is saved when Banshee shows up, screams, and the Desert Dwellers can't handle it so they retreat. Collective Man is just so interesting to me. The villain is actually five people merged into one, specifically five brothers from China. When they merge together, they apparently gain a connection to everyone in China. You heard that right. Everybody. The connection allows Collective Man, as the brother mashup is called, to draw on power from any Chinese person they want. Drawing on 10,000 people one time gave the Collective Man enough strength to handle Sasquatch. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, though. The brothers almost died from absorbing too many people's life forces at one time. I think that's karma right there. The brothers also have another very odd ability. They can make any Chinese person a clone of a brother and then merge with them. They have a hive mind, meaning they can mentally speak to just each other, but if they want to speak the old fashioned way, but are a few miles away from each other, they can just teleport to wherever their brother happens to be. It turns out you may need to prepare for trouble, make it double, as there are no rules when it comes to combining. You don't have to be like five brothers in one, you can go two brothers stay together, three brothers together, four, one, it doesn't matter. You can get different size of the villain persona. The brothers fought the X-Men when the X-Men were in town to look into Zorn. The Five made it very hard to do so as they created an army of themselves to attack the X-Men. I just can't believe the brothers merged, merged together and are able to then call on the power of all of China. Okay, so in the Marvel Universe there is Man Ape, that is M'Baku, but this ain't about him even though he is more popular. We are looking at Ape Man and also briefly touching on the concept of the Annie Men. So Ape Man was a human, Gordon Kiefer, that dressed in an ape suit. He had a pretty iconic start to his career, he tried to rob Stark Industries obviously failed and went to jail. But his ape thing worked in his favor. Criminal Mastermind, the organizer, was starting something called the Annie Men, a team made up of other animal or insect themed villains. Ape Man was a natural fit for the squad, and so Catman, also a team member, broke him out of jail. There have been many Annie Men, but the team that started it off and surrounded Ape Man was him. Cat 
Batman, Frogman, and Birdman. They fought against the X-Men in X-Men 94. The Anti-Men showed up to take over a military base and the X-Men said nope. It's in this comic that it's shown that Count Nefaria did some experimentation on the Anti-Men to make them more like their animal counterparts and significantly less human. Ape Man becomes way stronger than he used to be. The fight with the X-Men doesn't go well for the heroes at first. The reason? They're too tired. The X-Men get it together though and in the process Ape Man gets to experience Storm's power firsthand. The X-Men do come out on top which really isn't shocking in the slightest. Ape Man does meet his end eventually due to an explosion. Bloody Bess, she is a queen, she is mother, she deserves attention. She is a pirate and currently little is known about her past. Her present is a different story. The woman is a pirate. She is part of the Crimson Pirates. The Crimson Pirates and the X-Men first went mutant abilities to sword when the pirates were temporary allies with Goth, a shifty guy involved with unethical trading. The allies assisted with releasing someone that really should have stayed in X-Men custody. The X-Men ended up fighting the allies and of course Bloody Bess and the X-Men were winning but there was some possession involved and the X-Men were captured. Bloody Bess was in charge of keeping that section of the team in check. The team was taken to this market and then things went south from there for the pirates. Goth was no more by the end of the battle and Bess along with the other pirates fled. The Crimson Pirates stuck together and worked as kind of like mercs for hire. Bloody Bess as a pirate is very very good at sword fighting but she also has telepathic powers. She once tried to use the powers to connect with Omega Black for an assignment but instead let the Shadow King loose. The king possessed her fellow pirates and they attacked her. She called to Nightcrawler for help, they had a little thing going on. He arrived, the X-Men arrived, the X-Men also then got possessed and Nightcrawler and Bess had to fight together to save the day. Last we know of Bloody Bess, she has dedicated her days to finding her old pirate friends. All in all, a very cool character on a cool team and yet she has less than 10 appearances. She debuted in the year 2000 and her last appearance was in 2015 so hopefully she gets picked back up soon. Back when Hank McCoy, Beast, was being recruited by Professor X to join the X-Men, there was another guy who wanted to get Beast on his side. His name was Orlando Furio and he wanted to conquer the world. He wanted Hank on his side so bad he kidnapped him and his parents. He used Hank's parents as leverage to get Hank to steal a mini energy reactor. The reactor was used to power a machine that was designed to create global disasters. The good news is the X-Men eventually arrived and made sure the machine would never even once be used and they freed Hank and his parents. The machine exploded and, con and the guy Conquistador was caught in the destruction and presumably also exploded. He really committed to the bit though, the conquistador. He carries around a sword designed to look like what the actual conquistadors would have had. It splits into a three pronged stun weapon that really hurts if its blast is directed at you. Not only does he dress like a conquistador, but he managed to find a bunch of other people that were also willing to dress like conquistadors to be his henchmen. He operates out of a building that was either from that time or built in that fashion. No one is doing it like him anymore. Bring back villains that have a theme and stuck to it like it was on sale at Party City. Honestly, I don't want to see any more villains that just were all black and have pointy faces. I want camp, I want drama, and I want people to have a brand. So this next guy, his name is Thug, and that's what he is. He looks like a robot cowboy that has seen better days. Thug made a name for himself in the comics as part of Loeb's team. Loeb was very interested in the science behind humans turning into mutants even though they were born with no X gene. Thug assisted in Scalp Hunter's capture and along the way fought various X Men. He came head to head with the X-Men again later during the Experience Substance Promotional Gala. Thug is not a mutant, he is a human cyborg. He had been working close to John Sublime and received cybernetic enhancements from him. Their purpose was to mimic mutant powers. They made him very hard to hurt, he was resistant to most attacks pain wise, but you can clearly hurt the guy if the array of scars on him or anything to go off of. Probably the most interesting thing to me that would be just so useful when in a fight is the fact that Loeb was able to down download info about the X-Men, who they are and how they fight into his brain. He downloaded that into Thug, so Thug had a better chance at fighting them. Very cool. This Thug debuted in Uncanny X-Men 515 in 2009, but there are other Thug characters. They are green and they have no correlation to 616 Thug. The villain El Tigre debuted in X-Men 25 in 1966. His human name is Juan Moroz and he was a treasure hunter. Specifically, he focused on treasures from the 
ancient world. He is a menace. That is literally what he is described as on the cover of his debut comic. In that comic, he finds an amulet that belongs to the Mayan sky god. It gives him an array of powers like telepathy, telekinesis, and something called precognition, knowing if danger is coming or near. El Tigre with all these powers only exists when he has part of the sky god's amulet. When both pieces are put together, he just turns into the sky god. X-Men issue 25 explains this whole journey. In issue 26, we see a fight between the X-Men and El Tigre, with the X-Men trying to get the amulet off. They do, of course, succeed, and El Tigre is back to himself again and arrested. He later reappears to fight off against Kazar in issues 3, 4, and 5 of volume 2, but issue 5 is where El Tigre has met his match in the form of the Mystic Mist. The mist causes him to evolve to the state of death, and he falls off a cliff. We do see a very old, very still body, so I think it's safe to say El Tigre is permanently resting. But you never know. The Neo race is made of super mutants, and we are looking at super mutant Salvo. He was part of the Neo war clan that brawled with the X-Men. It happened toward the beginning of the war between humans and mutants. The war kicked off when all the mutant powers were removed by the High Evolutionary, but you probably know that already. He survived the scrap with the X-Men. He didn't survive Magneto. He tried to attack him. He was torn apart. Why did Salvo attack the master of magnetism, one of the most powerful mutants? I don't know. If I were made of solid metal, which is what Salvo is made of, I simply would not have done that. I have a lot of questions about this guy. One thing about Salvo is, is the metal. He can turn into like guns on his arms and he draws the ammo from his body. But if he does that, would he eventually disappear? I have to wonder because I imagine the only thing he has to draw from himself is himself. Is he just shooting pieces of himself? And would it said ammo stay as metal forever or would you be left with toes on the ground? I feel like these are valid questions, but would this mean he has a very powerful healing factor if he were to regenerate every atom he's lost in a fight? Lots of questions for a character that I will probably never see again. White Rabbit is Lorena Dodson, and while she might kind of seem like a joke villain, we've seen some pretty dark storylines featuring her in the past few years. White Rabbit is often out to prove that she's one of the baddest bads around and earn acclaim and recognition for her misdeeds. In the absolute carnage one shot, Symbiote Spider Man, we get to see White Rabbit featured in a much darker tale, when she runs into a judge who at one point came into contact with the Venom symbiote. In the flashback, we find out she ends up getting on his bad side, and in order to get back at him for what she believes was an unfair trial, she comes after him and his son, confronting them with a gun. It turns out the weapon is a joke gun, which actually shoots out just a little flag that says bang. But the shock of the whole event actually triggers a heart attack in the judge's son, Dan, who dies as a result. White Rabbit is arrested, but escapes out of her trial, being busted out by a large mech-like rabbit, very White Rabbit style. She torments the judge as she leaves, who attempts to break into the courtroom to kill her, but accidentally shoots an innocent court stenographer instead. Lorena might have shown remorse here, but instead she actually felt absolved of guilt by the judge's act, showing just how twisted and cold she can be, something that we we don't always see a side of her, and I honestly feel like she can be pretty scary at times because of that. These are the kinds of stories I would love to see more of with White Rabbit. What do you think of White Rabbit? Would you like to see more just like intense stories with villains? I feel like we just sometimes don't get enough of those. I mean, sometimes we get too many. Once again, Joker, I'm looking at you. Amazo is no ordinary android. He possesses technology that allows him to replicate the abilities and powers of the superheroes that he battles. This gives him a significant advantage in combat, making him an opponent to be reckoned with and that's not all. Amazo can even duplicate his opponent's weapons, making him an even more challenging adversary. This is a villain who can take on not just the powers of the Justice League, but who can also grapple, lasso, and fly majestically with a cape, I imagine, if he so chooses, with the best of them. The Flash, Aquaman, Martian Manhunter, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern make up the roster that Amazo initially faced, and as such, these are usually the power sets that he possesses by default. But in general, Amazo is pretty amazing. Yeah, they don't do a lot with him, I feel like. This next one is honestly just so ridiculous. We're talking about Swarm, a ridiculous villain, but that doesn't mean that I, of course, don't want more of him in the comics. After all, he is ridiculous, and if you know me, if you've watched any videos that I have hosted, you know that I love 
ridiculous. Who is Swarm? He's a German World War II scientist who is made up of bees. Killer bees. He escaped after the war and had enough loot in his possession to basically fund his research on killer bees. What he likes to do, mad science stuff. That research led him to becoming devoured by a swarm of initially passive bees who were turned monstrous and then became basically uncontrollable. He was trying to control them and it backfired. However, his consciousness ended up merging with the bees as he was devoured, allowing him to basically live on in the swarm, which he often manipulates into a humanoid shape. Also, I gotta say, I was so excited when I was playing Marvel Strike Force when I got Swarm in my game. We're not sponsored, but... We sh I wish we were. Marvel Strike Force, hit us up, come on. This next villain is very obscure. We're talking about Baron Bug. Yeah, we got another bug villain for you if you like bug villains, I know I do. Baron Bug and his insect army. He first appeared in House of Mystery issue number 163 back in the 1960s. Here he was introduced as the wildest villain yet on the cover and ended up going up against hero Robbie Reed, the original owner of the H dial for those that didn't know. Despite the claimed that he was the wildest villain. This wasn't enough to keep Baron Bug going in terms of his momentum, and he quickly fell into obscurity. He did resurface many years later in the 2000s in the 52 series and Doom Patrol, but still most people don't even know who he is, never mind the fact that he was once labeled as the wildest villain in all of DC Comics. A bold claim indeed. One of my favorite new villains from Spider-Man, this one actually comes to us from a not as well known Spider-Man title, or at least I don't think as many people know about it, Spine Tingling Spider-Man. Now we're not talking about the physical comic series, which also is really great, but instead the digital only Infinity comic. If you aren't familiar with the Infinity comics, they are nice, light, short reads that are laid out more like kind of like a webtoon where you like scroll down vertically through them to the end. I personally love this format. It's so cool and there's just so much alternate and interesting stuff that creatives can do with storytelling in this format. The Infinity Comics are also only available through Marvel Unlimited, so if you want to check them out, get Marvel Unlimited and you can check them all out. Honestly, Marvel Unlimited is also great. Once again, not sponsored, but I wish we were. We should be. Marvel. In the Infinity Comic by Saladin Ahmed, the villain in this story haunts Spider-Man with nightmares, keeping him awake and exhausted. Honestly, my biggest fear, I constantly feel like I'm over working myself and I do not get enough sleep due to having mm, some mild insomnia I'd say and I have a fear of dying from exhaustion as a result. Although I hope I'm a long way away from that and I'm not that exhausted. <laughs> In the end we learn that this villain is known simply as the sleep stealer. Honestly like I said so scary and they also have a haunting song which you can find on Marvel's website that accompanies them as well being played throughout the comic. I think it's also on YouTube too. It's yeah, you should listen to it. It's creepy. Ooh. From super creepy to super goofy, Calendar Man to most people is just a guy who is obsessed with the date. What a ridiculous villain. But in reality, he's also one of the most accomplished villains. During his first appearance, he almost managed to defeat Batman, one of the greatest and smartest detectives in the entire world, by giving him an almost unsolvable problem. That's right, he almost stumped Batman. Calendar Man sent an anonymous letter promising to commit five crimes, one each day, each one corresponding to a particular season in theme, with the fifth day also being a clue as to the true identity of Calendar Man with the fifth season. What is the fifth season? Batman failed to capture Calendar Man on the first four days, often arriving late to the scene of the crime. On the fifth day, it was only an ad for Calendar Man's side hustle as a magician as he was playing for a suspicious amount of time coinciding with the crimes, five days at the Bijou Theater in Gotham, that allowed Batman to connect the dots. Where would Batman be without ads from the local newspaper? Where would any of us be without the local newspaper? Even Batman knows that local news is important. Also, I didn't say what the fifth season was, but you you can guess what it is in the comments and we'll also see how many of you are probably familiar with that story because I know I could figure it out. When I got to that reveal I was like really? Oh okay. Mr. Smile and Mr. Sulk both have too cool a design to not do more things in the comics. They make their first appearance back in Doctor Strange issue number 5 back in 2020 and only recently made another new appearance in Vengeance of the Moon Knight earlier this year in 2024. Reminding me of how much I love them and think they deserve just more appearances. Hopefully we won't have to 
wait another few years before we get another appearance of these two. You might think you know Polka Dot Man, but do you really know him? If you've seen James Gunn's The Suicide Squad, you are familiar with the version of Abner Krill, but the original Polka Dot Man, also Abner Krill, of the New Earth continuity, was a bit different when it came to his power set. Initially, when Polka Dot Man or Mr. Polka Dot first appeared, he came armed with multiple different weapons, which actually all came from the Polka Dots on his suit. He could basically pull them off his suit and then turn them into any means of different weapons and devices. Super cool. Even once turning one into a getaway vehicle. Yeah, an entire vehicle from one polka dot. This is the version of polka dot man I'd be interested in seeing getting more love, especially if we got like a live action version of this version of polka dot man. Although I did enjoy the version that they included in the Suicide Squad, so you know, that was good too, but the polka dots were a little different. What's better than leaping somewhat high? Walking on stilts. That's the premise behind this strange Marvel supervillain. Wilbur Day is a scientist who began his life of crime after stealing a co worker's design and using it to build a pair of armored stilt legs. Granted, his entire body is covered in metallic armor as well, and it is pretty strong. He even smashed She Hulk down through the street and into a subway tunnel one time during a fight. Pretty impressive. But tragically, being taller than other heroes does not mean you're automatically better than them in a fight. There's, of course, that whole knock the legs out from under them strategy and of course his armor also like apparently has weak spots which have been exposed in the comics before to just easily take him down. They're like oh a weak point. Poke. He's done. Iron Man at one point even fought armor with armor by throwing one of Stiltman's legs right back in his face after he detached them to jettison away and knock Stiltman out as a result. Poor Stiltman, he just can't catch a break. And finally, our last, but certainly not our least villain, definitely our most villain, Silver Swan, has such a cool design that when I first saw her in modern day comics, I thought she was actually a new character. But it turns out no. She is a classic Wonder Woman villain. The fact that I did didn't know this made me think that she just hasn't gotten enough love throughout her history. So I'm here to help remedy that fact by including her on this list and telling you about her in case you didn't know either. There have been a few different versions of Silver Swan over the years, but she is at her core originally an 80s character, making her first appearance in Wonder Woman issue number 288 back in 1981. In the modern day, she is Vanessa Capitellis, and her powers allow her to manipulate tiny nanite robots in her bloodstream. Move over, Bloodshot. Initially, the character was known for her flight abilities and sonic scream, and for those that love the classic version, do not worry, she still has both those powers in the modern day as well. The West Coast Avengers get all the weird villains. Cactus is a great example. He is a cactus, and he's funny. Literally the first time he's seen in West Coast Avengers 17, Wonder Man laughs at him because he's he's a cactus. Cactus was created by the Dominius computer from a desert cactus. The computer gave the cactus human-like mobility and intelligence. This cactus is the original, but there are hundreds of duplicates out there apparently. Cactus's powers are shooting his cactus needles at a destructive speed and regenerating quickly as he is technically a super powered plant. There were two other villains created from desert elements alongside Cactus. They were Butt made of rock and Gilla made from the venomous lizard called the Gilla Monster. A super cactus while funny and cool didn't stand much of a chance against the West Coast Avengers and was defeated but maybe we'll see a clone of him somewhere soon. Live action two gun kid or rawhide kid can fight it. The leader of the group of desert mitfits, Cactus was in was Sunstroke. He was a human, however we don't really know how he got his powers. The villain just says he created himself, whatever that means. All he says to explain is that a man's sense of strategy was melded with the power of the day star. Merging with this power made him capable of absorbing light and heat. He can also generate light and heat to attack with. He did threaten to melt the armor off Iron Man's back. He fought the Avengers in the desert that day and disappeared shortly after that battle was ultimately lost. He resurfaced to attend a weapons expo and briefly fought Captain America. He went on to fight the X-Men, later he joined the Masters of Evil, but was arrested after the team unsuccessfully took on the Thunderbolts. Echidna is literally mother. She is the mother of monsters both in Greek mythology and Marvel mythology. She has fought the Avengers standard a few times and was affiliated with the Defenders of the Deep. She helped King Namor keep humans out of the water when the king declared the oceans off limits to everything that wasn't native to it. Echidna was also part of the Doom 
two maidens. During her time there, she attempted to recruit the Amazons, but ended up fighting the Amazons and losing. Most of her scraps with the Avengers happened while she was on the Defenders of the Deep. Eventually, she fought Ghost Rider and was neutralized by him. Icon Among Men, literally his name is Icon. Icon appeared in two issues, Excalibur 59 and 60. He was a Wakandan biochemist who experimented on himself with the advanced tech Wakanda had to offer. The experiments resulted in him gaining the ability to turn himself and others into wood. With his new power, he set his eyes on the Wakandan throne. He had the idea in his head that Black Panther did not respect him as a scientist. Not true, by the way. <laughs> One night during a Wakandan celebration, Icon shows up and starts turning people people to wood. Luckily, the Avengers are in attendance, something Icon did not plan for. He does have an ace up his sleeve though. When someone is turned to wood, they are then under Icon's control. Black Panther wouldn't let the Avengers attack the wooden army as they are still technically his subjects. But worry not, out of literally nowhere comes this guy called Jungle Man to distract Icon. Jungle Man gives the Avengers their moment to start the fight, but Icon surrenders very quickly. The reason is because his whole plan rested on taking the throne quickly through fear, because the turning to wood thing only lasts an hour. The change back makes him pass out and he's carried away by Black Panther. Grotesque is hard to kill, for real. He first fought against the X-Men and was the guy that everyone thought eliminated Professor X, but he didn't because it was changeling, but the energy blast grotesque took then didn't kill him, and he went on to become a menace to Miss Marvel next. She also hit him with something that should have ended him. He again survived and fought the Avengers. In this particular battle, he was part of a group of subterranean beings that were initially fleeing their home underground because it was being attacked by deviants. Grotesque was a villain at heart though, and later, after that battle, kidnapped Thor's human host, Donald Blake, holding him hostage while Grotesque's lava men brought the living rock to the surface. The idea was that the living rock would then blow up a lot of the surface world. Thor made sure that didn't happen and broke the rock before it could come up. All the energy from the rock supposedly destroyed Grotesque. But he lived. He really is that one Emma Roberts surprise but you thought you'd seen the last of me meme. Turns out the energy just destroyed his body, not his spirit, so that was still floating around. The lava men took that spirit and put it in impenetrable armor and he went on to fight the X-Men again. Nightcrawler found the cheat code to defeat spirit armor grotesque. He took off his helmet. That's it. That caused the spirit to dissipate. Is this the end for grotesque? Who knows? He's come back so many times. I wouldn't be surprised if we see him again soon. Making a deal with the devil is a common occurrence in the Marvel Universe. Actor Jason Rowland joined the trend in Tower of Shadows 5 when he made a deal with a demon, acting success in exchange for his soul. The demon was revealed to be Satanish, created by Dormammu, and one of the most powerful demons seen by Earth. Jason's side effect of the deal was he looked like a monster, so he stayed out of the spotlight for a few years. He also, in that time, took on the villain name Hangman. Eventually, he met the mercenary group Night Shift and took over the team for Satanish. Hangman convinced the team to give up their souls to him so he could have more fame and power. The only thing was in the middle of all of this, his group caught the attention of the West Coast Avengers. The West Coast Avengers and Night Shift, while initially at odds, joined forces once the Night Shift realized their souls were in jeopardy. When the two teams defeated Hangman and his master, Hangman left to join another team of villains, the Lethal Legion. The Legion belonged to Satanish, and they again fought the West Coast Avengers and the Lost. The name Hangman didn't come out of nowhere, he carries around an enchanted rope. The rope can be as long as he wants it to be, and you can't cut it unless he wants you to. Literally, by force of will, Hangman can make the rope uncuttable. The rope is like an extension of Hangman as it responds telepathically to him. But if you hurt the rope, you won't hurt him. Necrodamus was born all shriveled up. His body was incredibly weak. The natural fix here is to turn to dark magic. That's the only thing you can do. Necro discovered that he can gain strength and even a godlike form if he steals the lives of innocent people. Classic move. The first time he tried it, he was defeated by the Defenders. The second time he tried it, he was stopped by the Avengers, specifically Scarlet Witch. She sent his soul straight to Limbo. Eventually, he did make it out of Limbo and fought the Fantastic Four and then was sent back to 
limbo. Eventually, the shriveled man was taken care of by Agatha Harkness when she created zombies to attack him. He did have quite the run though. Agatha, Fantastic Four, Defenders, and of course the Avengers. Even though Necro's physical body was weak, he still had some magical powers like flight, teleportation, energy bolts, and shields. There are actually three Marvel characters that have taken on the name Chlorine, and none of them are popular. Marvel keeps trying and it has yet to work. I think they are all villains too. For sure the Chlorine I'm talking about right now is a villain. The actual name of this maybe person was never revealed, but his body is made of Chlorine, so he is Chlorine. I don't think this villain is human. He refers to humans as humans, and usually if you are a human you wouldn't make a point to do that. This particular version of the character has only been seen once in Avengers Volume 1 Issue 188. In that single issue we meet the whole team of elements actually. There's four of them, Chlorine, Carbon, Phosphorus, Vanadium, and Radium. They are referred to as the Elementals, but they are not affiliated with the ones in Spider-Man Far From Home at all. The Elementals catch the attention of the Avengers because they are messing with a nuclear reactor. They might have been humans that forgot they were humans, it's complicated. What we do know is that they take humans to this pod connected to the nuclear reactor to rearrange their atoms to make them the desired element. So maybe that's where they all came from. They are trying to create a hundred more element people, that is their goal. My guess is they want the whole periodic table. They fail, and the Avengers eventually defeat them. Chlorine did make the team retreat at first though, since his entire body is chlorine, he can release large quantities of chlorine gas and that's very poisonous. He doesn't seem to have any other powers past that though. The Avengers defeat the elementals by blowing up their reactor. The mixture of nuclear plasma and their charged atoms breaks down their atomic structures, which is their bodies. So it's presumed that they all, including chlorine, are done for. But according to the conservation of mass, nothing can be created or destroyed though. It's possible that if the character were to pick up steam, someone could just do some weird experiment and put all the atoms back together and we'd have chlorine again. This guy was primarily a villain to Thor, but did scrap with the Avengers too. Jared Carstairs was a skilled inventor and weatherman. Jared was not a good person. He stalked a girl to the point of getting fired from being the local weatherman. He couldn't handle not having the weather in his life, so he became weather maker. He created a suit that could create weather, not just sunny days, but also rain and tornadoes and lightning and hail. He a force to be reckoned with. He ended up kidnapping the person he stalked, and that's when the Avengers stepped in. Weather maker did a decent job of holding off the Avengers until Thor came back and destroyed the suit's power pack. Without it, the weather maker was just a guy. He was arrested, but the clever guy hid some weather circuitry in a hollow tooth and used that to escape jail. His escape effort channeled the Godstorm, which had been imprisoned by Thor, and the Godstorm hoped that this weather crazed man would be his vessel of vengeance against Thor. So the weather maker got actual powers from this Godstorm and became Torrent. He ransacked New York City until Thor returned to take him back back to Asgard. The guy used so much power, he pretty much exhausted himself. This made it easy for Thor to bring Torrent to Odin and get depowered and sent back to Earth. All of this happened in the Thor Godstorm series from 2001. You know how some people believe that every celebrity is secretly a member of some like demonic group or something? Well Marvel actually did explore that once. This villain's name is Defiler and he fought the West Coast Avengers. The Defiler is a demon. His particular brand of demon does not reside in our dimension, but does does need the life force of others to survive and maintain his powers and his dimension. So he decided to come and kidnap people on Earth. But he did it with style. He arrived to Earth as a rock star. His band was called Corruption of Innocence. Iconic all around, no notes here. It's such a clever idea because people love celebrities, they will follow them anywhere, so it really wasn't hard for the guy to get people to literally follow him anywhere. And when he finished them off, there were hundreds of other people willing to take their place. The Defiler took everything up up a notch at one of their concerts and started kidnapping the entire crowd. That's not even the wildest part of this issue, the whole thing is bonkers. To save all the people that have been transported through the portal to the demon dimension, Hank Pym and Mockingbird go to the dimension with a big rope tied around Pym. There are at least a hundred people to save though, and all their life forces have been depleted so they're all too weak to walk out. The solution, Hank Pym takes a fingerboard, those little tiny skateboards, and turns it into a huge skateboard so 
everyone can ride it out. The Defiler ultimately does get defeated when he is thrown back into his world. It's presumed that he is gone forever and died alongside his world. The world has nothing on it to feed anymore, so it is presumably gone. If you want to check out all the wacky antics, the comic is West Coast Avengers Volume 2, Issue 38. The story of Martin Lee, Mr. Negative, is actually quite interesting. The man who would become Mr. Negative was a member of the Snakeheads in China. He smuggled immigrants into the United States as a crew member of the Golden Mountain ship. But when the ship crashed onto the New York City shores, he stole the identity of one of the deceased immigrants named Martin Lee, but was unfortunately captured by the Magia crime family and delivered to the chemist Simon Marshall, who was developing a new synthetic substance called D Light and was testing it on runaway teens and illegal immigrants. Thanks to D Light and his unique biology, Martin Lee survived and developed superpowers related to the Dark Force and the Light Force, and he became Mr. Negative, dedicating himself to becoming Chinatown's kingpin of crime. He can take control of other minds and empower others and objects with Dark Force energy. He has the strength to send Spider Man flying through two whole buildings. He can tank blows from Spider Man and Anti Venom and is fast enough to dodge bullets. Whisper Adair is a villain that I actually had never heard of before. She's been around since 2000 and as a street level villain, mainly to Batman, but to other heroes as well from time to time, she's actually quite unique. Originally having ties to the League of Shadows, Whisper was given a serum by Raish al Ghul that not only made her immortal, but gave her the terrifying ability to turn into a literal snake lady that can spit acid. If that weren't enough though, she even gained minor mind control abilities, and the serum even gave her the power to create a small group of men who also have the ability to shapeshift into different animals. While she is tied to both the League of Shadows and Intergang, her loyalty is mainly to herself, and she has become infamous in the Gotham Underworld. Steel Serpent is basically the nemesis of Iron Fist, and he is quite the capable chappy. Davos is the son of the Thunderer, aka Lai Kung, and growing up, there was a lot of pressure on him to become the next Iron Fist. Davos took his shot at trying to defeat the dragon Shao Lao in order to gain the power of the Iron Fist, but he ultimately lost and was defeated. The fight itself was not sanctioned, and for that, he was banished from Kun Lun and swore to wrest the power of the Iron Fist from whoever would succeed in the task. That was Danny Rand. As the Steel Serpent, he actually managed to fulfill that goal when he beat Danny in combat and took the power of the Iron Fist for himself, that is, until his own defeat. Davos's powers were then restored by the Crane Mother in exchange for becoming the champion of the mystical land of Kun Z. Every time I have to talk about the Batman villain known as Cornelius Sturk, I get a whole lot of heebie jeebies. Sturk suffers from delusions which make him believe that he requires the nutrients of a human heart in order to stay alive. But not just any heart. Specifically, Cornelius believes that the heart is the most nutritious when it is full of norepinephrine, a natural hormone that secretes when a person is terrified, as well as adrenaline. So he uses his unexplained psionic abilities to mentally make people perceive him as someone else, which, other than allowing him to break out of Arkham Asylum the first time, also allows him to get close to his victims and then completely terrify them in the most insane ways possible before he quits quickly ends their lives and partakes in a nice old hearty meal. Cornelius is incredibly effective, and he's been able to both evade Batman and even make the Dark Knight go unconscious. Carlos Le Morto, a crime lord in South America and parts of Europe, first ever appeared as the villain Black Tarantula in Amazing Spider-Man number 419, and not too long after that, he gave Spider-Man one of the most absolutely brutal beatdowns I have ever seen the wall crawler suffer. The title of Black Tarantula is a legacy title that is handed down generation to generation, with the the heir to the title being taken from an early age to begin a life of intense training. Now, I personally couldn't find how Carlos gained superhuman abilities, but he certainly has them and used them when he beat up Spider Man. The Black Tarantula has superhuman agility and strength, able to optimally press over 30 tons. He can exert himself at peak for 24 hours, he's nearly bulletproof, his speed is faster than Spider Man's, he has absurdly powerful eyesight, he has the ability to heal both himself and others from near fatal injuries, and if that all weren't enough, he even has optic blasts. He has acted in some heroic capacities from time to time, which the heroes need to thank their lucky stars for because he can steamroll a heck of a lot of people. DC's Deathstroke is one of a few villains on this list that 
really toes the line of being a mere street level villain. With physical abilities 10 times that of a normal human being, and the ability to use 90% of his brain, Deathstroke is a guy that has proven himself more than enough times. He has fought multiple different members of the Justice League, and even when his natural abilities have not been enough, he has found numerous ways to power himself up enough to get the job done. Even being able to fight on par with Superman. He has taken down the Atom, Impulse, Batman, Kid Flash, the Phantom Lady, Uncle Sam, and obviously the Teen Titans. During Identity Crisis, he nearly took down the entire Justice League, taking down each member with methods tailored to each of their strengths and weaknesses before they rallied. But even with all of that, being a mercenary first and foremost, Deathstroke started as and often finds himself working on a street level capacity more often than anything else. Okay, so if you know who the mutant known as Legion is, the one who has hundreds of different alternate personalities that all have different mutant powers, well, Mary Walker is sort of like that. Only for Mary, she has only a handful of alternate personalities and they just allow her to access the powers that as just Mary, she can't access. Those powers include limited amounts of pyrokinesis, telekinesis to move small objects, grabbing her drop weapons, or even turning objects into armor, and telepathy usually used to manipulate others, cause distractions, or influence people to do things without thinking, like grabbing their weapons. Her Mary persona is actually a pretty timid and quiet person, but her other main persona is Typhoid, who is more adventurous, lustful, and violent. She later adopted a few other personas, like Bloody Mary, who was sadistic and brutal, and pretty much hated all men, and Zero, who was a cold, calculated, and militaristic person. Of all the characters on this list, I think Poison Ivy is by far not only the most powerful, but also the one who has the least amount of business being just a street level villain. Dr. Pamela Isley was a brilliant botanist who knew everything there is to know about plant life. She managed to work her way up to a position researching plants at Wayne Enterprises, but was fired after suggesting using plant based chemicals to develop brainwashing substances. As she was being escorted out by security, she spilled chemicals all over herself from her newest assignment and gained a connection to the green, an elemental force that connects all plant life. As a Batman villain, Ivy's goals aren't as simple as robbing banks and running gangs. She fights for the environment, using her connection over all plant life to really cause big problems, as her control over plant life can reach a global scale. And she's even put the Man of Steel under her control using her powerful toxins. Poison Ivy is basically a god in Batman street level villain clothing. Brock Rumlow was a gang member and criminal in New York City from a young age. As an adult, he honed his criminal talents under the tutelage of Taskmaster and became a mercenary and assassin, eventually gaining the attention and approval of the Red Skull. Rumlow's physical abilities have been enhanced to the peak of human ability, rivaling Captain America himself. He is highly skilled in combat, and he at one point also gained the ability to fire energy blasts capable of vaporizing multiple dudes from his head thanks to the Terrigen Mists, but this was only temporary. A lot of his feats have been against Captain America, who he physically matches, but he has physically manhandled quite a lot of people and has taken the lives of many others with his bare hands. He has tanked some incredibly heavy hits and is often underappreciated for just how much damage he can both take out and dish out. Basically, if Captain America can do it, there's a good chance that Crossbones can do it too, which makes him pretty darn capable. And lastly, maybe more powerful than you think is a bit of a lie for this point because when it comes to the Batman villain Bane, he is widely known to be wildly powerful, especially as he is the one infamous for breaking the bat. Other than breaking the bat, Bane is largely known for his incredible levels of strength, which is even impressive before he uses his venom, being much stronger than Batman himself. After being pumped full of venom though, he gains a low superhuman level of strength, becoming capable of lifting up to 3 tons, as well as becoming superhumanly durable, fast, and even gaining a level of superhuman healing. But his strength is only one half of the equation, because what some people forget is that Bane also has a genius level intellect, without ever actually going to school. He is a polymath, expert tactician, escapologist, multilingual, and even has a photographic memory. You couple all of that with his martial skill, and it's easy to see why Bane has become one of the Dark Knight's most feared adversaries. Then Riley Spider-Man once fought a demonic train, a possessed 
train. I love comic book writers because how did this idea even happen? I'm obsessed. The train does have a title. It is the 666 train, of course, all aboard the 666 train. Doctor Strange's death and death of Doctor Strange Spider-Man causes a lot of problems as it resulted in the magic used to keep certain magical threats captive, loosening their hold. So all of these bad magical things started escaping. Not good. If you were wondering why Peter Parker wasn't handling this, it's because he was in a coma. Felicia or Black Cat was helping out because she didn't trust Ben that much to be a good Spider-Man, so lucky her. She also got to fight the demonic Polar Express. I think it's actually the New York City subway. The train is possessed, but it is also maybe like a portal to the underworld because there are dozens of demons coming out of it. The task was specifically to exercise the 666 train. Ben and Black Cat succeeded by defeating all the demons coming out of it. I really hope this idea originated from someone missing their morning train one too many times. Okay, so this next villain antagonized a hero that I also can't believe exists and antagonized the villain right back. The heckler was the hero. His powers are literally just be annoying. That's me. I don't know. I'm secretly the heckler. The hero wasn't super popular, which means his villain's popularity is basically non-existent. They're also a little bit silly. Boss Glitter was the main antagonist of the first heckler issue. Don't let the ridiculous name fool you. He is not a DIY king. He is a mob boss. A very dangerous mob boss with a little flair. I can't stress this enough. This villain looks ridiculous, but he is ruthless. He looks like a clown trying to impersonate Prince, but he controls the entire city with an iron fist. He uses old Mardi Gras masks to hide his face. The villain has a bunch of lieutenants that manage different parts of the city for him, and the heckler keeps defeating them and throwing them in jail. So naturally, Boss Glitter wants the heckler to heckle no more. When his lieutenants fail to end his comedy act, Glitter sends a bouquet of flowers with a bomb in them. The heckler does still survive though, and we don't hear from Boss Glitter anymore. Not because something happened to him, but because something happened to the heckler comics. They had bad sales, so it was cancelled after six issues. Boss Glitter does now live in my head rent free though. His real name is Alessandro Hummer. I don't know why he chose Boss Glitter, never explained, maybe because glitter gets everywhere, I guess we'll never know. I do not personally know which Marvel writer sat down and decided to create a villain whose only power was juggling, but oh wow do I thank them for their service. Thank you Mark, thank you Elliot. Oddball is the character and he is, as stated, a juggler. That's, that's it, that's his power. This guy doesn't have any special abilities other than really good hand eye coordination. Oddball juggles dangerous things, so he is threatening. He juggles balls similar to like smoke grenades and there are some with corrosive liquid inside. There are spiky edge balls, it's all very creative. There are more but basically if you think the weapon can be made or put in a ball, he can juggle it. He was part of some bad guy teams like Death Throws. That was a team specifically made of evil jugglers. I am not lying, I promise you. And he also joined the Masters of Evil. I just can't believe that there is a villain that all they have going for them is juggling. Do Mark and Elliot hate the circus? I don't know. In all fairness, the method of taking something random and creating a character has been around a long time and used not only by Marvel but also DC, like Kite Man. Who hates kites that much? Turns out this one does have some history behind it. The real name for Kite Man is Charles Brown. There was a comic strip character that often gets his kite stuck in trees and his name was Charlie Brown, so Charles may have been based off Charlie. Kite Man wasn't super popular when he first got on people's radar, but he started feeling the wind at his back when he was in Harley Quinn the Animated Series. The guy had a pretty big role in that series and now is getting his own show. According to the reliable source that is the internet, it looks like it's set to be released this this year, so we will check back in a few months. Glad the character found his place, his niche, if you will, but he is just so niche. What do you mean this grown man is just flying around with a giant kite strapped to his back? Actually, that's just the Wright brothers. Those, um, uh, those American original aviators have quite a bit in common with Kite Man. Unique to Kite Man, of course, there are weapon kites like a trap net kite and a really, really big kite. People in the Marvel Universe have been trying to recreate the Super Soldier Serum since it created Captain America. Not every trial goes well and some go unbelievably poorly. Horace Littleton attempted to recreate the serum, but he wanted to add a little something. That something was, and since I'm not sure if we can say it here, take the first letters of long, slow, down. Okay, first letters of long, slow, down. Got it? I hope so. Shockingly, this version of the super serum did not pick up steam and the guy lost his funding. This meant he was forced to test the serum on himself. He turned into Dr. Mind Bubble, a tree 
truly mind-boggling villain. He blows bubbles, evil bubbles, that trap his enemies' minds. They create a virtual reality for the person in the bubble and it's very, very real. The person truly believes they exist there and have no idea they are in a bubble. It's also outrageous. The only way to escape the bubble is if you decided to put an end to your existence in the bubble realm, then you can wake back up in actual reality. Dr. Mind Bubble was defeated by Captain America when Cap bent the Mind Bubble tube in his head with his shield. That meant all the bubbles were forced to stay in Mind Bubble's head and that made the guy go crazier than he already was. He then launched his own mind body and soul out of a window. DC creates some truly unhinged villain designs. This time, it's an unborn baby that has super intelligence that lives its life suspended in the top portion of an advanced robotic suit. Catch all that? Orphan is the baby's villain name. Technically it's Orphan 3 or Orphan the 3rd maybe. Orphan was going to be just regular baby, like born instead of permanently suspended in a villain suit, but his parents were scientists in the DC universe and that never goes well for anyone. The scientists were studying this thing called the source wall. The wall was breached and his parents were eliminated. Luckily for Orphan, they had a techno-familiar named Darling that saved Orphan's life and receiving all the energy caused him to have above average intellect for an unborn baby. Thank goodness we barely want Orphan running around as is. Imagine if he actually had the intelligence of a baby the entire time. Paste pot. Pete was so goofy, the character reinvented himself. He came to the decision with the help of Spider-Man when Spidey laughed at him. Was it a nice thing for Spider-Man to do? Maybe not, but when you decide to become a villain, sorry, but I think people don't need to be as nice to you. He turned to crime because he thought it would make him more money, which at least turned to crime for the right reason, you know, because you want to be a menace to society. Anyway, the guy was already making a lot of money. He created, like, the gorilla glue of the Marvel Universe, very sticky. His glue is what he uses to create crime and he literally carries it around in a bucket with his glue gun in hand connected to the bucket using a tube. It's all very technical, but I don't know, there has to be a better way. You know, dude, you're rich, get a backpack. The glue is a force to be reckoned with, backpack or not. The paste dries instantly and can stick to almost anywhere. The only thing that can affect the glue is ultraviolet light. Eventually, Pete upgraded to a system that didn't involve him carrying a bucket around. But as said, at the beginning of this point, the villain reinvented himself with the unwanted help of Spider-Man. Spider-Man is known for his little quips and roasts. When Spidey met Paste Pot Pete, he laughed a little too hard and the villain had had enough and decided to be become Trapster. He thought it sounded more menacing. I don't know if I necessarily agree. It kind of sounds like a board game to me, but y'all let me know what you think in the comments. Let's revisit a favorite villain of mine, Calendar Man. Every iteration of this character is fabulous. You can't deny that. I will not let you. His first, middle, and last names are all calendar adjacent. His name is Julian Gregory Day. Julian themes his crimes and his criminal outfits to different holidays. So for example, this past weekend, we probably would have had an evil Easter bunny roaming the streets hiding little evil eggs. The first version of Calendar Man was probably meant to be a ridiculous sort of joke villain, but DC is in the rewriting era and gave this guy a bit more depth and also totally changed his look. I prefer the old one that was looking camp right in the eye, but I guess the man with the calendar tattooed around his head is also fine. Calendar Man does not have any superpowers, I guess, but he is very good at inventing. He always has a new gadget to perfectly match the holiday or event he is emulating. He also, before they backstoried him, he also always had new outfits. This man's closet must be a department store, honestly. Probably the most outrageous version of the character, if everything previously stated wasn't enough, was a version of him from the Tom King run of Batman. That guy was a metahuman. A metahuman that would be reborn once a year when he shed his skin, so he was almost like a lizard. DC has had some controversial characters over the years. This villain is yet another fun little example. I was so excited when I found him because he's from Colombia and I'm from Colombia and I was like, that's so cool. I really hope he's a well-rounded and interesting villain with no racially insensitive characteristics at all. His name is Snowflame and he is a cartel leader that creates the white powder that shares a name with Coca-Cola. Yeah. In order to have powers, Snowflame must use the other method of ingesting the substance, the nose. Once that happens, he is super strong, speedy, can't feel pain, and if you touch him, he is coated in the snow, so you will also be affected by the substance. He also has fire powers because you'll need that when it comes to the snow. 
The character is not widely loved for obvious reasons, but there is one person out there that is single handedly keeping this character afloat. There is a fan made webcomic out there that gives the character backstory and even puts him up against various DC heroes. This person just really loves Snowflame. The character has made a few reappearances and died three times. The first time was his first appearance against the New Guardians. He was in a shed that blew up. The second was a rebooted version of the character that met his end to a giant jaguar. And the third and current final time, instead of snorting his usual power inducing stuff, he snorted a poison frog. Everything I just said only makes sense here. I literally can't say this anywhere else. I'll sound bonkers. Anyway, Snowflame, ew, hate him. Dr. Forklift has only been seen once, and that was enough. I am flabbergasted with this one, for real. So he was originally a regular guy, and his job was performer. He was the great golly gosh show and his trained hamsters, and they were a traveling act. They were performing at a chemical plant, and one of the hamsters got stage fright, and somehow was strong enough to knock over a big spotlight that fell and hit Dr. Forklift, and a bunch of chemicals got spilled in the process, and there was a forklift nearby. A big explosion happened, and when the guy woke up, his bottom half was gone and replaced with the forklift. This sounds like I'm making it up, but I swear this is real. Dr. Forklift also became a genius because he happened to also be beside scientific papers when the chemical explosion thing happened. In the single issue he was in, the doctor was swapping humans' minds with hamsters so he could have an army and only hamsters would listen to him. Plus, the doctor needs endless electricity to survive, so he keeps the hamsters running on a wheel that generates electricity. Plastic Man ends up thwarting the villain after a battle between all the humans and hamsters bodies and all the hamsters and humans bodies and Plastic Man and Dr. Forklift. Dr. Forklift gets arrested, all the hamsters and humans are given their rightful brains back, so a happy ending overall. But reading this comic was a fever dream. It's Plastic Man Volume 2 Issue 11 if you want a good laugh. DC has done it again, creating a truly unhinged character design in the form of Orphan 3 or Orphan the Third. Orphan is an orphan. Orphan is also a baby that lives suspended in an advanced robotic suit and thinks like an adult. Orphan's parents were studying the source wall. The source wall is the barrier that surrounds the multiverse. One day that barrier was breached, obliterating Orphan's parents. Orphan's mom was pregnant with him at the time and he survived because of his family's techno familiar, Darling. Darling assimilated Orphan's mom's body and created an artificial womb. Since Orphan and Darling were so close to the wall being breached, Orphan absorbed the power from what was on the other side of the wall, energy from the source. The source is the source of everything. Its power is limitless. And Orphan has that running through his veins. It gives him powers like teleportation and energy blasts. Darling and Orphan are tied to each other in some ways. When Darling was destroyed, Orphan Orphan went into a sort of like catatonic state. Dead Ringer can take on the form of any dead body he touches and can cause way more problems than you might think. Louis Dexter is a mutant. His mimicking abilities are not reserved for people, he can also mimic animals. He discovered his abilities by touching his deceased cat and father, and that is so traumatic. Dexter chose to use his powers for evil. He started to remove pieces of heroes from their graves because when he touches a deceased super person, he gets their powers. Dexter Dexter is limited to one person at a time, and if he wants to revisit the body of someone, he has to touch them again. And that is hard when you take decaying into account. Seems like it could be a major inconvenience, so he decided to make his life easier. He was going to start carrying pieces of heroes in a cigar box with him. The pieces? Gross. Dead Ringer's most famous battle was when he and his partner Super Patriot became Porcupine and Captain America to destroy Captain America's reputation. The two staged a fight at a charity gala and deliberately hurt the crowd, the pair were eventually arrested. Death Adder is one of the many villains Death Ringer has impersonated, so spoiler, he was deceased at one point, but was revived and then died again. Death Adder was Roland Burroughs. Roland received a surgery courtesy of Roxon Oil Company. The surgery was supposed to give him claws, a bionic tail, and gills. The part of the surgery to give him the gills went wrong, and Roland lost the ability to speak, becoming mute. Roland, now a villain, received his costume and joined the Serpent squad. Death Adder and the Serpents became mercs for hire. He was a pretty serious foe as his tail could move up to 60 miles per hour and was adorned with a bunch of sharp poisonous prongs. So if the sheer force of getting smacked doesn't take you out, the poison sure will. His claws 
also had the poison in them and Death Adder has had about 30 appearances total. Powerful sorcerer Duran once tried unleashing monsters in Mexico City causing immense amounts of damage. Duran lives in Mexico and he hated seeing the nature there getting destroyed. He was angry with developers and the large amounts of pollution caused by the tourism industry and just the way people treat his home. He became radicalized and that is not something you want from a powerful sorcerer. Duran kidnapped a girl and used her as a vessel for the true power of the earth as Duran puts it. So she caused a massive explosion downtown and it got some local Mexican heroes involved and Superman. This all happened in Superman Annual Volume 2 Issue 12. It's also the only appearance Duran has had. The big final battle happens in downtown Mexico City and it's a disaster. There is a huge firestorm unleashed and it takes the powers of Superman and the three local heroes to get everything under control. It wasn't easy. Duran learned sorcery from Firewolf and Firewolf was able to control Superman's mind. So now Duran is capable of that and also crushing the windpipes of Superman with only his mind, among other things, like being able to call upon the primal powers of Mother Earth. The American dragon, Unkahilla, was based on a real legend in Sue mythology and she's also a complete menace. She is a demon residing in the ground and it destroys everything around her, especially the surface and anyone on it. She has bad vibes to the point where she can pollute the soil she just passes through, making it unusable. Unkahilla is somewhere between 30 to 50 feet long. She terrorizes the local indigenous communities, kidnapping people, swallowing people whole, destroying the food supply. Literally not the kind of pest you want in your garden. She can also create monster children that are like mini hers. She needed to be exterminated and Wolverine was around and ready to help so he went to take her down. Only she was a tough fight. It wasn't until her heart was separated from her body that she finally went down. Sticks and Stone have very different origin stories but they cause trouble together like they are brothers. Sticks was originally homeless and Stone was on a team of scientists doing experimental cancer research. The team of scientists were offering compensation for anyone willing to be experimented on so Sticks signed up. Stone had an interesting theory that he was unauthorized to test. Stone thought that someone could become immune to cancer the same way someone can become immune to snake bites. Of course he did run the test on Sticks and of course it ended in the worst way. Sticks became a walking cancer decaying any organic material he comes in contact with. Awful outcome but at least Stone's theory was right, Sticks was immune to cancer himself. Stone felt really bad about this and vowed to find a cure for sticks. Somewhere along the way, we actually don't know how it happened, but stone turned into a big stone monster and with that he gained the ability to decay any inorganic matter. So sticks and stone together are a team you do not want to go up against no matter who or what you are. Blood Shadow is a very cool villain that I would never want to meet, but I think they should bring back anyway. He was known for facing off against Wolverine and perishing at the claws of Wolverine. Blood Shadow was capable of telepathy. He was also intimately familiar with the human body and its deadly pressure points like the back of his hand. Blood Shadow was also a trained martial artist. He combined this trio of skills into an interesting fighting style. He would use telepathy to determine an opponent's next move, his martial arts training to counter it, and his knowledge of the human body to determine which deadly pressure points would be exposed and which ones he could hit in the moment. Unfortunately for Blood Shadow, his telepathy was a bit too powerful in a fight with Wolverine and he accidentally unlocked Wolverine's base feral animalistic instincts. No one can survive those, not even Blood Shadow. Headhunter started out as nothing more than a con woman, but using her powers of persuasion, she became the most powerful woman on Wall Street. She is deranged, and I mean that with everything in me. Headhunter is obsessed with Namor, so obsessed she kidnaps him and puts him in her wall of heads. You know what hunters do with animal heads they take as trophies? She did that with the people that crossed her on her journey to the top of Wall Street. She also has the ability to mesmerize people and control them so that also has helped her in her journey to the top of the financial world. The wall was eventually destroyed and it turns out all the people were actually just catatonic, put to sleep by Headhunter's mesmerizing powers. Headhunter also has little knife fingers and she wears a lot of suits. The powerful villainess known as Verna once tried to destroy all spider people. Y'all I've been waiting for the chance to talk about Verna. Verna is from Earth 001. She comes from a family that has dedicated their lives to traveling across the 
multiverse, hunting down and exterminating all spider totems. The family goes by the Inheritors. Like a leech, they parasite powers from other people, feeding on their life forces. The Inheritors eventually locked in on the spider totems because they wanted to defeat the spider deity of Earth 001, so that means it has to be every other world's battle too. They went up against an army of spider people, the odds were never in their favor. Verna and her family were left on a super radioactive Earth, Earth 3145, and were trapped there forever as they are sensitive to radiation and have to stay put in a tower. Verna ultimately passed after escaping said tower while trying to get her father's soul that was trapped in a crystal. Verna's main power is the life force energy absorption thing. Once Verna touches a person, even if she doesn't drain your life force all the way and you live, she can still sense you from almost anywhere, which is super creepy. Verna is also technically immortal. She doesn't age, she doesn't get sick, but she can be exterminated. If someone were to split her in two, she's done for. So overall, a pretty sick woman in all senses of the word, but the reason I have been waiting to mention her, one of my favorite movies when I was a little girl was Barbie Fairytopia. The main villain in that movie was La Verna, and she looks exactly the same as Marvel's Verna. Look at the hair and look at the names, they are the same. I am not saying they copied Barbie, but there are clues. Deathstalker was once a wealthy man from a prestigious family, then he decided to become a criminal. He invented something called the T-Ray or Time Displacer Ray. When used, it transports its victims to an interdimensional void for a few hours. When used, the ray looked really scary because it would make people dissolve before your eyes. It wasn't until hours later that you would find out the person was actually fine. In a fight with Daredevil, his gun exploded and it sent him to the limbo-like realm permanently. He eventually figured out how to get back to Earth, but the catch was he could only be here for up to like five hours before he was pulled back to limbo. During the five hours, he appeared like he was a phantom and he really used that to his advantage, stealing tech and creating cybernetic death grip devices to put in his gloves. Including his dead ringer appearance, Deathstalker has appeared about 24 times. Doctor Doom is always a villain that many people already put on a pedestal. So of course, it makes sense that he would eventually get powers to match his status. This all went down during the 2015 Secret Wars event when Doctor Doom was elevated to the status of not just Emperor, but God, becoming God Emperor Doom, after being the only person willing to challenge the Beyonders during the final moments of the incursion. When everything came crashing down, Doom took the power for himself and built a patchwork-like world out of all the alternate universes that had collided with one another. It was later revealed that to have absolute power and shape reality, he'd actually been using the powers of Molecule Man, who was kept hidden away. Eventually, in a battle against his rival Reed Richards, Doom lost these powers after admitting that Reed probably would have been able to do a better job at recreating the multiverse following the incursions, thereby causing Molecule Man to instead choose to bestow his power to Mr. Fantastic. Nanawe wasn't always known for being a demigod and prince. In the previous Neuruth continuity, he is hinted at being the son of the King of All Sharks, also known as the Shark God. Although this was all all kind of seen as a rumor in regards to his origin. Initially, it wasn't very concrete. He wouldn't become a god over time necessarily, but instead would have this origin more firmly established as being his true origin as time went on in the comics. In the Prime Earth continuity and the Harley Quinn animated series today, this is firmly cemented as King Shark's origins, making him a demigod. In fact, even in the newest Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League game, he's also a god. Like his father, Thane also has experience with wielding an insane amount of power. Initially though, Thane strove to simply be a healer in his everyday. He was eventually hunted down by Thanos, who was searching for his secret hidden son. Thane being an inhuman didn't have powers yet when Ebony Maw first found him, but as a hybrid inhuman and eternal child, his powers were triggered and brought to the surface after undergoing Terragenesis. This drastically changed his appearance and gave him an insta-kill power, where everyone within a certain, rather large radius of him would be killed simply by by being near him, which is a pretty traumatizing thing to happen when you're like, I want to save people. Oh my gosh, my powers kill everyone. He could also encase people in amber. In fact, if you've heard of the story where Kitty Pride helped Star-Lord save Spartax from the brood after the entire planet was encased in amber, the person who had done the encasing, yeah, that was Thane. Thane would not only have insane power just from these abilities, but also would for a time have Get this, the Phoenix Force. Don't worry though, Thane would later lose the Phoenix Force after becoming trapped in the God Quarry, where he remains, or at least where he 
remains at the time of this recording until I guess we remember him and pull him out of the god quarry. There is a lot that Zod has done to sell himself as a god tier character. I feel like every time we see him, he is doing something even more extra than the last time. During the Prime Earth continuity, there is a point where Amanda Waller is lucky or unlucky enough perhaps to capture Zod to use him on her Task Force X, aka the Suicide Squad. However, even after having an explosive kryptonite device placed within his brain, Zod escapes Waller. Yeah does his own brain surgery, basically. Tormented by the pain of his family who are currently trapped inside the Phantom Zone, he manages to remove the bomb from his head by himself using his, using his heat vision to break free and go rescue his family. After doing so, he also seeks out a planet for them to settle on to turn into a sort of new Krypton. The indigenous people of this planet are actually willing to work for Zod as they believe him and his family to be gods. Madeline Pryor was kind of born a god, when you think about it. She is a clone of Jean Grey, whose life was sparked by a piece of the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force itself is like a cosmic god of sorts. It's not like, I don't know if we call it a god like officially, but it's godlike in power. And because a piece of that is built into Maddie, in a way, Maddie is also like a god. If you're wondering how or why I'm including her here when she, as I've said, has always been a god, since this is the exact reason I'm not including villains like Loki on this list, so for all of you who are wondering why Loki isn't here, that's why I didn't include him, it has to do with the fact that she wasn't always aware of her true origin. During the time she wasn't aware, Maddie simply acted like a normal human woman. However, after suffering a mental break, Maddie was transformed into a supremely However, after suffering a mental break when she realized the truth of her origin, Maddie was transformed into a supremely powerful being, allowing her to tap into her true, unlimited potential. Poison Ivy is a character who honestly should always be at a god tier, just based on her power set, honestly. But there's only really ever been one point that I can think of where she decided to take things to that kind of level. For the most part, Ivy stays pretty confined to Gotham, giving Batman and the city trouble with her eco-terror, but not really extending much beyond Gotham's reach. Now and then, I've seen her also go to some other cities, I've seen her go on a crime spree with Harley and Metropolis as well, but really, she stays pretty confined to a single city with her mischief. However, in the Tom King story, Everyone Loves Ivy, trauma caused Ivy to strike out and go bigger, much bigger, taking over the whole world through vegetables. Yeah, she mind controlled people through the veggies that they ate and she used her control over everyone to basically make the world a better place and bring about kind of world peace, but of course at the expense of free will. A big no-no in the hero books. Ivy, however, was convinced to relinquish control by Harley Quinn, who Batman and Catwoman basically recruited to help them deal with this situation, and ended up giving up her influence and her power at the end of the story as a result. Owen Reese was just a normal man before he received powers that made him a god, or at least put him on that level. He was a lab technician when one day fixing an atomic device, he just poked a hole through the universe and into the multiverse, accidentally reaching across space and time into the universe of the Beyonders and tapping into a massive amount of power there. This power would put him on an omnipotent and omniscient level, allowing him to rearrange the molecules of matter and even energy. He could even do that with organics, although for a long time there was a psionic barrier in place so that he wouldn't do that because it's pretty messed up even for a villain. Molecule Man can also warp reality on a massive galactic scale. It's really weird to think of this next villain as a god, but even he has earned that status before in the comics. I know, it's crazy. And strangely, it's actually happened more than once, sort of. The other version of the character who was imbued with god powers was from an alternate reality, admittedly. But even in the main continuity, Joker has gone god tier. In this case, it all went down when he managed to trick Superman fan and often mischievous antagonist, Mr. Mixie is Pitalik. Mr. Mixie only intended to give Joker 0.01% of his power, but instead he accidentally gave him 99.99%. Yeah. Yikes. Needless to say, Joker most definitely did not use this power to do anything good. Eating China as though it were takeout, yeah, super weird and super scary, and tormenting Batman daily and killing him only to res him the next day so that he could do that all over again. It should surprise no one that of course there was a time when Thanos became an almost literal god. When and where was this? In an alternate future that ended up being erased, but where CGR, aka Cosmic Ghost Rider, still hails from. 
even though it doesn't exist. This was a future where Thanos had committed to winning over Death's heart by destroying not just half of all life in the galaxy, but all life in the galaxy. He had eradicated life down to the point that only a few people remained, and eventually only he did. This King Thanos, who was a ruler of the universe, brought in his past self to eliminate him. However, this reality was erased when the younger Thanos refused to do his older self's bidding, and despite all his power, still saw King Thanos as being weak. Uh, rude. Cersei went from being a very powerful witch to being a literal goddess. How did this happen? Well, in Justice League Dark, we learned of the Witch Marked, powerful women who had pieces of Hecate's power hidden away within themselves. Diana Prince, aka Wonder Woman, is revealed to be one of these individuals as we discover, you know, who they all are, or so we think, as it's later revealed that Cersei was also secretly one of Hecate's chosen witch marked. She uses her attachment to Hecate to devise a plot to steal all the power from the other witch marked and Hecate herself. Cersei actually succeeds in this surprisingly, and so gains a godly amount of power, putting her on the level of the goddess of magic, Hecate herself. In fact, because there is no Hecate after that, she basically is the new Hecate.